Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. Today we're going to cover wood turning for beginners and we're going to focus on the spindle gouge. This is what I consider to be one of the critical tools for turning spindles for furniture makers. If that interests you, stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell, which will alert you whenever we release a new video. Anytime we use a new tool or technique, we'll leave a description down below so that make it easier for you to find. All right, let's get back to work. If your interest in turning is for furniture making, I'm talking about legs, drawer knobs, any kind of spindle, then there are four tools that you're going to want to have. You're going to need to learn how to sharpen and you're going to want to eventually master. The skew chisel we've already covered. We're also going to do at some point in the future a parting tool. We'll also cover a scraper. But today we're going to go through using the spindle gouge. Now this, I consider this to be probably critical tool number two. And it's easy to do both beads and coves and flats, although I prefer this, the uh, skew chisel for that, but you really need to know how to use this one. Probably one of the more difficult ones to sharpen, but we're going to take you through that as well. And then we'll actually do some practical, uh, practical exercises on learning how to master this. And uh, once you do, you can get to a point where very little sanding is required. So the first thing I want to do is take you over to the grinder and show you how to sharpen this, at least the way I do it. This, uh, the way I do this is freehand. And uh, there are some jigs that you can get to help do it uh, a little more... Uh, Start again. I was taught how to turn and how to sharpen by Dale Nish. And this is kind of done like a fingernail, that shape. And I do it freehand. Uh, you can do it on a disc sander. You can do it on a belt sander. I happen to use a grinder. What I like about this is it's so fast. This is a CBN wheel. And it's an 80 grit. And it cuts so much quicker than everything else. And it'll keep the tool much cooler. Uh, we're going to turn it on first. So there's the angle that we want, and we need to go all the way around. So what we're going to do is we're going to find that angle, and then we're going to move up like this. So if you look at my right hand, you'll see that it goes in a big radius. And the nice thing about this steel is it's not terribly adversely affected by overheating, although you try not to do that. And if you screw it up, you can always eventually get it back to where you want. So it's not like it's the end of the world. So I, I kind of look down here and see where that bevel is, make contact, and then a big wide radius with my other hand. And it's nice. One of the advantages of a wheel that cuts really fast is you don't have to go in and make repetitive uh, cuts. So if you can get it so that it does all the cutting required, on one shot, you're not trying to come in and you're going to end up with a half a dozen different facets on there. So let me pay attention a little closer and try that again. Okay, didn't distort my shape. I can see that I've got a, a, a new radius or a new bevel all the way around. A little something funky going on here, but I don't think it's going to bother me. I went a little bit deep. Could take a little more material off there, but that'll still work. There's a bit of a burr on there. You can take it off if you want, but it'll actually come off when we're turning, so not to worry. Now, I'm going to actually take you over and show you another option where we use a, a, a disc sander in case you want to look at that method instead. Now, one of the reasons I like doing this on a disc sander is I feel like I have a little more control. It's lower and just seems to be a little bit easier. The disadvantage is it doesn't cut as fast and it doesn't cut as cool. You're going to have to decide what's best for you. I, I'm on top looking down and I can see when my the bevel angle I have is meeting up with the disc. I'm going to do the same thing. Now I managed to maintain that same bevel I did over in the grinder. so. I didn't change anything. Starting to get a little bit of a point there, but yeah, it'll still work. It's not like this has to be 100% perfect every time. You can get close enough, 
Now you can also do that on a, uh, on a horizontal belt sander. You're gonna hold it like that and just, it's the rotating. So you're turning this at the same time you're rolling the tool. You wanna keep this part stationary. That's where I support it with my left hand. And then while you're making contact, you're rolling up like this. It probably is one of the more difficult tools to sharpen. And you may have to do a little bit of practice. And when it, you know, you wanna to try to keep that shoulder and that shoulder at the same level. It may look a little bit funny the first few times you do it, but stick with it. It's not that, not impossible. I won't say it's not difficult, but I will say it's not impossible. All right, let's go to the lathe. I always recommend practicing with something really soft. Pine is my wood of choice for learning to turn. And I'm just using this center finder. I'll do it on both ends. The reason why you want a nice soft wood is if it happens to grab your tool, it's not going to uh, rip it out of your hands. Now I'm just going to uh, get a little point. I need something that has a point. Since I don't, I'll just use this. Doesn't need to be very deep. I remember we used to go in and actually saw cross marks on there, but I don't do that anymore. Just put it in the, uh, put it in the lathe, give it a whack, and that'll seat it well enough. Lock that down. You want that to be tight enough, you don't want things rolling around. Now I like to set my tool rest to be just, uh, just a little bit below center. Somewhere around there, you'll find what's comfortable for you and go with it. And I want it to be as close I shouldn't say close as possible, but quite close. I just have to clear these corners until I get it rounded over. I could at that point stop and move this in a little bit closer. Now, small diameter work requires faster RPM. It's all about, sur all about rim speed. How fast is that outside edge turning by your chisel? If you're doing a large piece of wood, then you're gonna slow down the RPM. Small piece of wood, you're gonna increase it. So it's always nice to turn from, turn into a void. So I'm gonna start out here and just work my way. Now, like the skew chisel, what you need to do, and I'll, I'll get this round first, and then we'll slow the uh, lathe down so you can actually see what's happening. If you want, you can cut the corners off first, but it's nice to learn how to work into a shoulder and create a nice transition, especially on a furniture leg where you may have a square section at the top and then it goes down into a full round. You've got to be able to come in there. Obviously you have this already planed, but you've got to come in there and make a nice clean shoulder. And you can do it Convex, concave or convex. We're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but as you can see, you've got to be able to do both. Well, let's go up here and get this completely round so we can come in and show you how the tool works and how you gain control so that it doesn't grab on you. Now I'm just going to set the tool on top and it doesn't vibrate then I know I'm I've managed to get it round. All right. Slow that speed down. 
like the skew, you have a flat spot. And you want that flat spot to come in and make contact with the wood. And then, once you find that point where you make contact, you're gonna roll up and in until you start to pick up a shaving. And you're always going to be working on the bottom half, again, maybe, I wouldn't say bottom third, but definitely bottom half. You get above there, the tool's gonna grab. So first thing you need to do is find where the bevel makes contact, not doing any cutting, and then you're just gonna roll it a bit until you start to pick up a shaving. That cutting edge engages the wood. And this is a shearing cut. Now you can go in and do this, but now you're scraping and you're not gonna get a very clean cut doing that as opposed to shearing where you're cutting like a plane blade or a chisel and it'll come off much more, well, I shouldn't say much more control, but much cleaner. Once you learn how to use it, you'll have all the control you need. All right, so let's pick that speed up. Now, since we're out here at the end, we can practice doing half of a bead. So you're gonna be on here and then you're going to roll over. And this, remember, you have, to, you have to be watching the top, not where the tool engages the wood, but up here. That's how you can tell what's going on. And that's how you're gonna control your shape. So I'm, I'm engaging the bevel and then I'm rolling the tool so I can tell that it starts to pick up or engage the wood. And when the tool is sharp, you have a nice clean surface. Now, if I was actually making a furniture leg, that I could go, well, I might hit that with the uh, 220 grit paper and that would be it just for a few seconds. Now you also want to practice making coves and that you're going to, again, the, the, first the bevel makes contact, then you roll that chisel until you engage the cutting edge somewhere below the halfway point. Now, when we did the, when we did the, uh, skew chisel. Now let me tell you what just happened there. When we did the skew chisel, we were able to do some very shallow coves. With a spindle gouge, you're able to go in and get a much tighter radius. Now, I always want to be cutting on the downhill. If you tried to cut on the uphill, you're going to tear the wood. So in order to do a cove like this, it's always going to be a two-step process. Half from one side, half from the other, and then you got to get a little bit of practice under your belt so that that transition in the middle will be nice and smooth. Starting on that shoulder is always difficult. If you don't get it just right, the tool catches and it runs back on you, so you just kind of have to Grit your teeth a little bit and carefully engage. Hold the tool with, Richard Raffin taught me this, a light grip. Yes, you want control, but if you've got a death grip on there, it's very difficult to feel what's happening. That's not a very gracious Cove, see if I can't clean that up a little bit. Almost ready to start over on this one. Clean shoulders. Got a few ripples in there that I 
don't like. Then we can do a bead. So now you're having to start on that point. And it's nice to have a, I would actually take my skew chisel and come in and make some relief cuts that you can then turn into. So starting here in the middle, again, bevels engaging, and then roll that. And you gotta get that skew, you gotta get that chisel over quite tight, or, or I should say almost upright like that in order to get down into that corner without hitting the other shoulder. This is where I think a skew chisel is superior. If you've got a large shoulder, it's not so bad, but trying to get into a tight, make a tight bead like that with a bowl gouge is gonna be a little more difficult than it needs to be. Okay, now let's move, I'm gonna move the tool rest and we'll finish this end. You have to be able to work both ways. And by that I mean is I'm gonna roll off this side now. Make sure you're clear. Now when you're starting from rough, you're gonna to have to feel where you're gonna engage the wood. Perhaps one of the hardest things to do when you first start is to discipline yourself to look up there at the top to see what's occurring. You always want to stare at the end of the chisel. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm much more comfortable going the other way. Let's save a little bit of this for doing a little more of that shoulder work. So we want to make a nice, a nice uh, convex transition from square to round. We're going to come in here. And I'm looking up here, watching that radius. You might actually want to put some, something dark behind it so that you can see the profile. I'm looking at a blonde floor, which makes it a little bit hard to see. start nice and clean I've got uh, mind you this is rough but we're not as quite smooth as we should be right there see if we can't go in and clean that up you're kind of starting in mid-air so it's difficult when you don't really have a reference point so you just kind of have to feel for where you're first engaged the wood and you're having to do this literally in mid-air because you're only intermittently making contact with the wood because you're working on those the corners of those four sides. A little different when you get into hardwoods, but practice on softwoods, get the technique down, and then you can advance to the hardwoods. And on this one, we'll do the uh, opposite. We'll do a concave shoulder. Same thing, you're kind of starting in midair. Keep your eyes up. If you can maintain the habit of looking at the top side, you'll be able to get a much more pleasing shape. Oh, 
Yeah, we can make that radius a little bit better than that. That cove. It's all about maintaining contact with the bevel. That's where your control comes in. Forward hand acts as a tool rest, and it's the back hand that really does all the work. Doesn't get the credit, it's cut him out of the picture, but it's the rolling and all of that manipulating is occurring from back here. I think if I was doing a bunch of these, I would purposely turn this around and work this way. Now, you notice I'm getting nice shavings as opposed to dust. And when you, when you start to produce dust, that's when it's time to go resharpen. But in practicing on pine or basswood, or anything like that with a good spindle gouge, well sharpened, you should be able to get, I would say, several hours before you ever have to go and touch it up again. And I would just keep paring that back until you get to the point where you can do it with the level of control that you're comfortable with. And then do the same thing for the code. Remember, that starting point can be a little bit dicey because the tool has a tendency to want to grab. So you just got to enter with caution. You want to have a lot of fun, get a piece of wet wood, fresh piece of tree. You get covered in sap, the shavings hold together and throw across the room. May as well have fun while you're doing it. Spindle gouge. Essential tool for any furniture maker wanting to add A new level of creativity to your work. Hi, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said, better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.